you've seen my videos before, you know I'm a big fan of Uri's work. She created the Strange Men Anthology, one of my favorite game series of all time. I recently tried one of her other games, Paranoiac, and while it definitely struggled in the gameplay department, the story was still really solid. That's always been Uri's strong suit. She's great at creating an interesting and emotional story. So when my comment section got flooded with requests to play Mermaid Swamp, of course I had to do it. Mermaid Swamp was originally released in 2013, meaning that chronologically we got Paranoiac, then the Crooked Man, then Mermaid Swamp. Hopefully this means we're in for a good story with some improved gameplay since Uri had more experience and some relatively mainstream success. Let's take a look at the synopsis on the official translator's website. Rin Yamazaki and her college friends have their car break down in the mountains on a trip. Fortunately, a kindly old man offers to let them stay at his house, but there's a legend about the swamp outside the mansion. I... what? This sounds like the plot of a Scooby-Doo episode, more so than usual. But Uri's a talented writer, so let's see where she takes it. Before we get into the game, I'd like to take a brief moment to thank today's sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder's the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, and it's available on PC and consoles for free. You take command of over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships of 10 nations, from 1920s vehicles like biplanes and armored cars, to more modern options like fighter jets and battle tanks. It's a highly detailed game with realistic vehicles, graphics, and sound effects. It includes one of the most sophisticated vehicle damage models in all of gaming, which is my favorite part since you get to disable your opponent's vehicles with precision and strategy. The game is highly optimized, allowing for a lag-free experience even on lower-end machines. You can join a worldwide community of over 70 million players in PvP battles, making it perfect for fans of military history. It's free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. Sign up right now with the link below to get a massive bonus pack on all platforms for new and returning players who haven't played in the last six months. It includes an exclusive vehicle decorator and multiple premium vehicles, but it's only available for a limited time, so make sure to sign up today. The game begins underwater. A dark silhouette appears to move closer, but before it's close enough to become discernible, Rin Yamazaki is abruptly awoken from the dream by her friends. The story follows a group of university students, Rin, Saitaro, Yuka, and Yuta. They're going on a trip together, and Rin does off. Their destination is never stated, but they're presently driving through the mountains on their way there. They aren't entirely sure where they are, as the fog keeps getting thicker and thicker, but all they can do is continue forward. The character art in cutscenes is the same style Uri always uses, with some different coloring and shading. I don't like the rendering here as much as Uri's other games, the hair almost looks metallic and it's kind of overly detailed compared to the rest of the body. It's not my favorite, but it's by no means bad. Oddly enough, the pause menu art looks substantially closer to Uri's other work. As the group continues to move through the fog, the car slowly crawls to a halt. The engine stopped, and Yuta can't get it to start again. Rin steps outside to take a look for herself. As she approaches the hood, she spots a figure in the distance. It's an old man wondering what Rin is doing in the middle of the mountains. She explains the situation, and he offers to let them stay at his home until they can get their car fixed. The group takes him up on this offer, temporarily leaving the car and following him further into the fog. As they walk, they learn quite a bit. This man's name is Yukio Suchida, and he owns two mansions near a swamp. One is old and run down, while one is newer. The new one was built in the 80s, and Mr. Suchida currently resides there. He shows the kids to the guest rooms before leaving to prepare dinner. Now look, the Crooked Man's plot sounded a little trite at first. Some random dude trying to hunt down the previous resident of his home because weird stuff is happening. It didn't sound like the most original plot, but it quickly came into its own and turned into a fascinating and well-executed story, even during the early stages of setup. Mermaid Swamp's plot is just a cheap horror movie. I made the joke about it sounding like a Scooby-Doo episode, but that was kind of spot on. A group of kids going on a trip, heading into mysterious woods after their car breaks down, then finding their way to a spooky mansion by following a mysterious old man who promises to help them out? It's just cheesy and overdone. But I have faith in Uri. Paranoiac's story started out a little rough too, but it improved as it went on. Reen heads off to see how her friends are holding up. This is where we can get a better read on their personalities. Saitaro is considered to be the smart one, but he's also really rude. He bickers with Reen a lot and is incredibly blunt. Unfortunately for us, Reen is very similar. Replace the intelligence trait with vulgarity and volume, and bam, you have our protagonist. Uri is usually pretty good at making you empathize with challenging protagonists. Keith from The Boogeyman isn't the kindest guy, but he cares about those he keeps close and wants the best for them, even if he struggles to convey that. Will from The Hanged Man is a rebellious teenager that lets his emotions get the better of him frequently, but he understands that this is an issue and he tries to rectify it over time by apologizing and attempting to remain self-aware. Reen does not develop as a character at all throughout the entire game. She's loud, rude, and proud of it, which prevented me from connecting to the character at all. Yuka is kind, quiet, and observant. When Seitaro and Reen were bickering in the car, she diffused the situation. Yuta is energetic and positive. He thinks the swamp outside looks beautiful and wants the others to still have fun, even though the car broke down. I like these two a lot more than Reen and Seitaro, so I'm looking forward to spending some time with them to balance out the negativity. We do get to spend time with them, right? 
right? After checking on her friends, Rain steps outside to take a look at the swamp. It's huge, and she can't even see the other side of the water due to all the fog. A stone monument sits to her left, but she can't make out what it says due to the aged writing. Before she can drag Seitaro over to read it for her, Mr. Suchida appears and explains everything. The monument's inscription tells the story of a local tale, the legend of Mermaid Swamp. Over a century ago, Mr. Suchida's family came into ownership of these mountains. One of the leaders who lived here during that time made his way down the mountains and towards the sea, stumbling upon a mermaid. He fell for her, bringing her back to his home and making a fish tank so she could stay with him. He used the nearby swamp water to fill the tank, causing the mermaid to grow weak. She swelled up, losing all her scales before eventually passing on. The legend states that the mermaid's wrath lived on, as young women began to vanish from the nearby village. This was known as the Mermaid's Curse. The stone monument was put up to mourn her. Reen dismisses the story before returning to the home to get some grub. The others enjoy their meal at a leisurely pace while Reen inhales the food at the speed of sound. Reen heads back to her room and hops into bed, experiencing the same exact dream as in the car. When she wakes up, Yuka is still asleep and seems to be feeling unwell. The boys are having a discussion in the lounge room. They're trying to figure out why the car stopped and how to fix it. Suchida shows up, letting the group know that he has to leave on a trip to a nearby village for a few days, but that they're welcome to continue their stay so they can try and get the car up and running. The kids promise not to stay for too long, contemplating leaving the car behind and just walking to a train station they passed earlier. Suchida warns against this, claiming that they wouldn't be able to get far due to the fog. He reminds them that the mountains are dangerous dangerous before taking his leaf. Now's as good a time as ever to talk about the sprite work. The environments look great as always, and the character sprites are kind of a halfway point between the Strange Men anthology and Paranoiac. I'm playing the remake of this game, so I took a cursory look at some footage of the original, only to find out that it used to be the same style as the Crooked Man. I'm not 100% sure if Uri was just using some kind of character creator originally, and then switched to her own sprite work later, or if she just decided to change her style entirely, but I definitely miss this older stuff. Reen decides to get some use out of the bath before the boys, accidentally falling asleep. She wakes up to find that the water in the tub has been replaced with muddy swamp water. She screams, jumping out. Seitaro hears this and sprints to make sure that she's okay, only to get Get screeched at by Reen for walking in on her. You just let out a blood-curdling scream. Of course someone's gonna try and check on you. This is oh not an early game. There's no way. You know, I'm double checking to make sure I wasn't lied to. No, this has to be an early game. Like the actual style of the art is like yeah. is literally Uri's. The two bicker for a while before deciding that something probably went wrong with the plumbing. Reen goes to check on Yuka, whose condition is worsened. Reen decides to let her rest for now, with the plan to bring some food and medicine to her tomorrow morning. For now, it's time to get some sleep. She plugs in her phone and climbs into bed, this time waking up to find that the world around her is entirely filled with water. It's just like her other dreams where she can breathe perfectly fine, so she decides to wander around a bit. Shadow in the hallway bolts toward Yuka's room, jumping on top of the girl and jolting Reen awake. She heads over to Yuka to check up on her, only to hear some unusual gurgling noises. Pulling back, the covers reveals a swollen and disfigured Yuka. Seitaro bursts in, telling Reen to call an ambulance with the phone in the lounge. The phone line is dead, and her phone is still out of battery from the previous night, having not charged at all. Yuta and Reen discuss the situation while Seitaro tries to find that nearby village to go get some help. Yuka looks like a bloated corpse, but she's still alive and breathing. While Yuta tries to logically think through the situation, Reen yells at him like a wonderful little ray of sunshine. Seitaro returns, having found nothing due to the blanket of fog. Reen yells at him too, so he yells back. I'm so happy that one of the two likable characters has been removed from the equation so we can hear even more bickering. Yuta interrupts, mentioning that this must be what Mr. Suchida was talking about. It's impossible to navigate in the fog, so they're stuck here for the time being. Reen is worried that Yuka will die, but Seitaro claims that she has a steady pulse and no fever. There's nothing wrong with her other than her appearance and the occasional mumble about being cold. They talk about methods for contacting help, but it seems futile. The power is off, and they can't tell right now because it's daytime. Even though they're in a room, with no windows or light sources other than the bulbs in the ceiling. Which are not working, because there's no power. Whatever. Saitaro mentions that there's supposed to be a map around here somewhere, so they should try and find it so they can use it to safely leave the area to go get help. The group splits up to search the house. Rain checks in on Yuka, hearing more muttering about being cold. She could try and find firewood to warm her friend up, but not knowing much about Yuka's condition makes Rain hesitate to try this. For now, she grabs a bedroom key from the wardrobe and continues her search. Saitaro's in the study upstairs, looking through every book for a map. Maybe you'll find some information on Yuka's condition. One of the weirder rooms on this floor is the aquarium area. There are fish tanks in the walls with this unusual close-up of a 
goldfish. The rooms of two kids are in the top right, mirroring each other. Each room displays a photo of half of a planet. One of the books in the study showed similar images to this, with the caption, The center of the world is the secret place of the gods. Sure enough, there's a secret room behind one of the shelves. Inside are some old documents, although Rin can't understand the old script. She returns to the study to ask Saitaro about the old mansion and the old documents. He says that they should continue their search of this mansion first before taking a look at those papers. The writing is faded, but Saitaro can make out something about preventing the propagation of germs. Maybe it's about making preservatives before the era of refrigeration? Rin keeps exploring, finding Yuta entranced by a painting in the dining room. The entire house is covered in similar paintings of women. He moves to the next and the next, with Rin getting increasingly more concerned before Yuta runs away entirely. She asks Saitaro about these paintings, learning that they all depict the character Ophelia from Hamlet. By the end of the story, she winds up drowning in a river. The cause was left ambiguous, prompting many artists to depict their own interpretations of the scene. Rin takes the key from Yuka's room, using it to unlock another bedroom. There's a note and a paperclip inside. The note has a bunch of arrows doodled on it, alongside some crudely drawn cartoon eyeballs. She continues to wander the second floor, finding a sitting room neighboring a locked door with a heavy vase. She uses some chopsticks from the kitchen to fetch a key from the bottom of the vase before using her paperclip to free the latch on the locked door. There's not much in here other than a note implying that something is hidden inside one of the clocks in the house. The key from the vase unlocks a room full of fish tanks. A diary in the corner states that something was locked away with that sorrowful year and month as the key. Not entirely sure what that means. Let's take another look at that scrap of paper with the eyes. The only thing with prominent eyes in the mansion are these tanks full of goldfish that have close-ups of the fish with glowing orange eyes. You can solve this puzzle by lining yourself up with the desolate stare of your fish friend and following the arrows step by step. Literally, you count your steps. This one's kind of weird because the fish can move and there are two tanks, but no matter what, you can only end up on two different tiles, so you'll find it eventually. One of the floorboards in this area is loose. Removing it reveals a news article from August of 1972. It details the death of Sayako Kawamoto and her two children, previous residents of this mansion. Witnesses claim that the mother was seen diving into an irrigation channel to save her drowning children, only for all three to meet the same fate. I suppose we found out what sorrowful year and month the key mentioned in that diary, but... I'm not sure where to use this information. With nothing else to do, Rin starts to double check each room. Ooh. Oh my god! Whoa. I guess that means something's in the closet now, huh? This game has exactly three jump scares in it. Usually I don't mind jump scares, but my god, these ones are cheap. I like jump scares that make sense in universe, like having an enemy break through a wall to initiate a chase. But for this, they just threw in a JPEG for a second and then left. There's no buildup of tension to complement the scare, it's just a lazy way to startle the player. I honestly wish they had done something closer to the witch's house. Rain finds a piece of paper in the closet. She once again cannot read the handwriting, so it's time to pad for time by asking Seitaro to read it for her. Thankfully, we can cut this interaction in half since they run into each other in the hallway. Seitaro finished exploring the study without finding any maps, but he did end up finding some lanterns since the power is out. He hands over two lanterns, asking Rin to get the other one to Yuta. She heads over to Yuta's room to hand it over, but uh, he's busy. Rin is not about to open the door while Yuta is fantasizing about their friend's blow-up glow-up, so she decides to leave the lantern by the door and tries to cleanse the noises from her mind as she goes to sleep for the night. Her worries for Yuka overtake her exhaustion, prompting her to leave bed and head to the other mansion. She ignores a nearby boat and shack, making her way straight to the front door. It's locked with a six-digit passcode, 197208 the date from the newspaper. This building is definitely a lot more rundown than the newer one, although it still has the paintings of Ophelia. There are three staircases heading upwards, but two are covered in some kind of slime that prevents Rain from using them without slipping. One of the rooms contains a children's diary, stating that the author's father showed them something wonderful and colorful, but that it's locked up. There's a duplicate key in this pillow, but the child cannot take it for fear of being caught. The only clean staircase leads to a room with a fireplace that leads to a hidden room. The ladder leading downwards is cut off short, so Rain will have to find alternative means of descending. As she moves towards the hall, she hears a noise. A glance out the window reveals a glistening figure in the swamp. Rain rushes over to investigate, but the being is gone. Yuta steps outside, asking Rain what she's doing. Yuta was heading off to the old mansion to investigate, so Rain offers to head back there with him and help look. He demands that she go back to her room so he can investigate alone, scaring Rain thoroughly enough to get exactly what he wants. Something is seriously off with Yuda. Because of this abrupt and obsessive switch in behavior, we no longer have any pleasant characters to be around. Rin heads to sleep, having another underwater dream. She's in the piano room on the second floor of the main mansion, listening to the ghostly shadows of the two dead children from the newspaper. They meet with the shadow of their grandmother, learning of the legend of Mermaid Swamp. The kids ask if the mermaid will come after them, but their grandma assures them that the mermaid fears the people of this house. But outsiders don't have that luxury. Outsiders will suffer through the mermaid's curse. Rin jolts awake from the dream, 
confused about what she just witnessed. So the mermaid's curse from the legend will affect people like her? Is that what's happening to Yuka? As she enters the hallway, Rin spots Yuta running out of Yuka's room. Yuka seems to be untouched, so Rin goes to wake up Saitaro with some of the most natural sounding dialogue of all time. Hey, wake up early to bald. Make me breakfast, for I am hungry. It's more like a crappy slasher film every second. The last of the food in the fridge is just enough for the two of them. They'll have to survive on snack foods from here on out. With their meal finished, the two decide to split up and search the mansions. Saitaro only looked through the study of the main mansion originally, so he'll take that building while Rin searches the old one. Saitaro makes it very clear that they shouldn't heat up Yuka's room. They need to avoid changing the situation since they don't know much about her condition. Rin continues her exploration, with the light allowing her to see much more. She finds the key to another study in the bathroom, using it to unlock the room next door. She spots something atop the bookshelf but can't reach it on her own, so she drags a small table into the room to stand on. It's a wind-up key for a clock. Now I can't tell if Reen lost her balance or if the table gave out, but whatever happened results in Reen falling backwards and knocking herself unconscious. When she opens her eyes, Yuka is standing above her. She's completely back to normal now and Reen insists that they go get some food to build her strength back. Yuka objects, claiming that she learned the secret of this house. Yuka is a hostage. She begins to shake violently begging Rain for help. Yuka is drenched in a liquid that begins to coat the floor. She grabs for Rain, telling her to return me. Saitaro shakes Rain awake, telling her off for taking a nap when they should be searching. Because when you find someone unconscious on a hardwood floor right next to a table pressed up against a shelf, it's best to assume that they decided it was nap time, not that they have a concussion. You know people ship these two? After Rain explains that she was knocked out, Saitaro still could not give less of a damn. He decides to take the study for himself while leaving everything else to Rain. Rain has already explored most of the first floor, but she can't check the second floor without getting rid of that slime first. There's a storeroom in the main building that probably has a mop, but it's very locked. For right now, Rin unlocks a door in the bottom right by melting some wax out of the keyhole. I'm not entirely sure how this works, since the wax would just be blocking the ability to use a key, not locking the door itself, but I'm sure I'm just forgetting something and that somebody can explain in the comments. Inside the room, Rin finds a letter to Mr. Suchida from Saiko Kawamoto, the woman in the newspaper. She claims that her lawyer suggested she demand compensation for emotional distress, although she'll only take what she needs for her children. What the hell happened between these two? She goes on to detail how she and her kids have been going through counseling, which has helped them greatly. Mr. Suchida made some kind of offer that Saiko needs time to think about as her wounds have yet to heal. I don't know what happened here, and I'm kind of scared to make assumptions without more information. So let's take the most pertinent piece of information from the letter. It sounds like the key to the storeroom is in the piano room. Rin finds this key inside the frame of one of the paintings, using it to unlock the storeroom and get the mop. There's a stack of firewood in this room that drastically changes the outcome of the game. Rin choosing whether to light the fireplace in Yuka's room will entirely change the girl's fate, locking you into two of the four possible endings. Whenever I play a game like this, the translator is always kind enough to list where the ending splits are so I can play save states and not have to replay the entire game to showcase the endings. Unfortunately for me, this doesn't account for the game breaking. I knew that my firewood choice would be important, so I figured that as soon as I saw it, I would throw down a save. When I walked into the storeroom and interacted with the firewood only to not get the option to take it, I figured it would appear later, maybe during a story beat. That's not the case, though. The game fully broke on me and did not display the option that it was supposed to. Because of this, I had to replay the entire game. We're gonna look at the endings in this order. 3, 1, 2, then 4 because that's how I got them after googling where the firewood decision was supposed to appear. Reen uses the mop to clean off the stairs, unlocking the rest of the building. This floor also has a book of plant facts, an old dresser with some writing, and a bunch of fish tanks. She jams her arm into one of the fish tanks, finding a plastic cap. There's also a hand in there that grabs her, but that's kinda expected at this point. Here's one of the issues present in every Uri game, but I feel the need to bring it up each time. I just got a button. I figured it might be able to fit on the boat outside. Using the button on the boat doesn't do anything, but when I talk to Seitaro, he takes takes a look at it and says, hey, maybe you can use it on the boat out front. Only then can I use the button on the boat, which apparently had a massive button-shaped hole in it the entire time. I will never understand why Uri adds puzzles where you can't acquire or use items without having certain interactions. This is probably the dozenth puzzle where this has happened in this game alone, and she continues to put these in her game for years to come. Most of these puzzles could easily be altered to still have these interactions as an optional hint. They aren't plot important. There isn't any character development by making Reen ask Saitaro where he thinks the button should go. Sure, it makes him seem smart, but I think we covered that by having him be in charge of the studies and by making him read the old scripting. Alongside asking about the button, Rin asks Saitaro about the writing on the dresser. He translates the text into three different times of day. These times come
combined with that wind-up key allow Reen to interact with the grandfather clock mentioned in the note from before. She uses the key to set the clock to the three times Setara mentioned, unlocking a secret compartment containing a bottle of hydrochloric acid that can be used to loosen the boards nailed to this door. These boards can then be placed over a hole in the second floor to gain access to another room. This room has a hammer, a golf club, and a rifle, of which Reen decides to take the golf club and the hammer. The rifle is left behind and never directly mentioned again. The phone rings. Reen picks it up, hearing Yuka's voice on the other side calling for help. She sprints back to Yuka's room, finding Yuta standing over her friend and commenting on how pretty she looks like this. When Reen tells him to back off, Yuta decides it's knife time. He's been acting weird ever since looking at those paintings, so Reen decides to destroy them. I hate this chase. The other big issue in every Uri game is that she loves turning your character around when you enter a door. You can enter a door from the top and emerge from the bottom, preventing you from holding down the walk buttons. You have to stop and try to quickly react to your environment so you don't accidentally walk right back into the killer because Uri decided you should be flipped 180 degrees. There are paintings to destroy in both the main and the old building, but if you try to go to the old one, Yuta will gain super speed and end your game. First, you need to use the golf club to destroy every painting in the main building. Then, Reen will make a comment about the old mansion so that you can make your way there. After destroying all the paintings, Yuta collapses in the hallway. Sitaro and Reen bring him back to his room and lay him in bed so he can rest. When he wakes up, Yuta remembers literally nothing from the past two days. Seitaro and Reen leave him to rest, discussing their plans elsewhere. Reen wants to leave and search for that village, but Seitaro insists that they stay, since he got completely lost when trying that himself. While he goes off to the study to continue his search, Reen throws caution to the wind and stumbles through the forest in search of the village. This entire section is essentially an invisible maze with foliage in the foreground so you can't see half the time. It's really tedious, and it does not line up visually at all. Reen eventually makes her way out of the trees and onto a dirt pathway. She's on the verge of passing out from exhaustion as Yuka slowly approaches. But it's not Yuka. It's a figment of Reen's imagination. It has to be. Yuka repeats herself from last time. Return me. Reen can't take it anymore. She just wants to go home. She's the one that wants to be returned. She desperately joins Yuka in her chant before eventually losing consciousness. She dreams of the figures once again. One tells another that they have to leave. They can't stay here as keeping their secret is worse than death. Worse than the curse. Her children are more important. She believes that her kids won't be raised properly with things like that around. We can gather that this is Sayako because she's speaking of escaping the house with her two children, but I have no clue who she's speaking to or what the secret is. The only other mention we have of a secret so far was that weird dream version of Yuka talking about being a hostage. The scene changes. It's clearly a different conversation, but it's still impossible to tell who is who because of the shadows. I think it's Saiko talking to some kind of kid other than her own since they're calling her stepmother and mention that they're glad that she can escape. This other person is more scared of death than they are of the secret, so they plan to remain. They encourage Psycho to go far away where their delusions can't reach her. We switch scenes one final time to find Psycho and her children heading out the front door. With the kids asking if they'll die or be cursed, Psycho doesn't know, but the three leave anyway. Alright, let's unpack this. There's some kind of secret that involves things that a mother would not be comfortable having her children around to the point where she would risk all three of their lives to get away. We also know that at some point after leaving, she and her children were found dead, having drowned. Plus, there was a letter from her to Mr. Sujita somewhere in the timeline, which could either be from before or after they arrived at the home. Was the offer that he made to let them come to the house in the first place, or was the trauma the kids experienced caused by the secret of the house? I'm still really lost at this point, but hopefully Uri manages to tie everything together once we get some more information. At this point, Saitaro has realized that Reen is missing and has gone into the woods to search for her. It's a completely different invisible maze this time, but it's far shorter. On the other side, Saitaro finally finds the village he was told about, but it appears to be deserted. Nobody responds to his door knocks. When he turns around, he spots an old woman and explains his situation, asking if she's seen his missing friend. She seems unsurprised, as many bad things happen in the landlord's house where they're staying. She mumbles about how it must have been distressing, but there are far more frightening things than a missing friend. She begins to elaborate, but is cut off by a man throwing open the door, yelling be gone outside her, and then dragging her inside. Even more confused, Saitaro continues to explore the village. These people clearly know something. He finds a graveyard with six incredibly old and worn graves. He can't even make out the names on the tombstones. He examines the sign next to it, labeling it as the Suchida family grave site. Not much is legible, but Saitaro can understand pieces here and there. Something about giving the family eternal protection. The next segment is heavily worn, with only a few legible words. Malice, already, transformed, and something inhuman. As he reads, a shadow approaches Saitaro. It vanishes right as it reaches him, and he clearly feels its presence. He continues his search, coming across a balled up Reen. She's crying, shaking, and completely unresponsive. Setaro picks her up and carries her back home. When Reen wakes up, she tells Setaro that all the unusual happenings are the fault of the mermaid's curse. Yuka's condition, Yuta's insanity, it's because the mermaid hates the people of this house. But for some reason, she cannot touch them, so she goes for the outsiders instead. 
Maybe she can't touch them because of something relating to that weird sign in the graveyard? Saitaro dismisses Rain's claims. There's no such thing as curses. They just need to find the map and get out of here. Before he can leave, he flinches in pain. He's had a headache since being in the village. He leaves, telling Rain to rest. You and I have known Rain for a very short period of time, yet I'm certain that we both know that there is no way in hell that she is doing that. She thinks about how this curse is part of the legend of Mermaid Swamp. Maybe the swamp part of the story is talking about the swamp water that killed the mermaid, but what if it's something more? Rain steps outside, diving into the waters of the swamp. She searches around, noticing a small glint at the bottom. It's light reflecting off of a hairpin, which she immediately grabs. As she attempts to surface for air, shadows surround her, murky forms that partially take the shape of humans. They grab her, repeating the same thing as Yuka. Seitaro splashes into the water, having seen Rin dive in from one of the windows upstairs. He grabs his friend, dragging her to safely and berating her for her recklessness. From his perspective, she was just tangled in some plants. Rin tries to explain the shadows, but Seitaro isn't having any of it. They start bickering even more, only stopping after Seitaro Taro flinches in even more pain from his headache. They agree to split up and continue searching while waiting for Mr. Suchida. Rin heads to the old mansion, picking up Yuta's knife and using it to slice into the pillow with the key. She heads to another small room, prying open one of the closet doors with her golf club and retrieving the boiler room key. The shed outside is actually the boiler room and it houses the key for the boat. As Rin steps outside, one of the stone fence pieces conveniently falls over. So she takes it? Back inside the mansion, Rin uses the key pillow on a new room. Inside is a puzzle where you match clothing colors to the plant book from before. The most memorable part of this puzzle is how when I went back to double check the book, it allowed me to pick it up. Wouldn't it have been so cool to pick that up the first time instead of wandering around the whole house trying to remember where it was? Anyway, the puzzle opens a box with a rope. This combined with the stake and her hammer allow Rin to secure a rope down through the passageway in the fireplace. And what do you know? She finally found the map. But it's only for the swamp, not the surrounding area. That's not particularly useful. There is a big red X worth investigating, though. Rin turns back so she can show Saitaro her findings, but she drops her lantern while standing directly next to the ladder. Instead of using the fact that she is literally right next to the ladder to climb it so she can find her rope and get out, she sits down and looks at some bleeding arms as they reach for her. The creature they belong to looks bloated, similar to Yuka. Rin panics so hard that instead of running away, she passes out. We switch perspectives to Saitaro, where he realizes that Rin is missing and leaves to go after her. His headache becomes so bad that he collapses as well. The next morning, Rin wakes up on the floor next to her lantern, somehow completely illuminated in this room without any windows once again. As soon as she climbs out and reaches the lobby, she runs into Saitaro. This is your final spoiler warning for this game. I'm going to be talking about all four endings in detail, so if you just want to hear my final thoughts, please skip to the timestamp on screen. Sitaro is acting unusual. Rin tries to show him the map, but he envelops her in a hug, shaking. He admits that he's terrified and doesn't know what to do anymore. He wants to stay with her for the rest of the day for his own comfort. Now, this would be a lot more believable if he wasn't speaking completely monotone. Rin tells him to screw off, which appears to be the correct choice since Sitaro pulls out the axe he was planning to kill her with. They engage in a short chase before Rin reaches a dead end. She has two options, dodge or don't dodge. This is super misleading, since don't dodge actually means punch. For the current ending, Rin jumps out of the way. Saitaro swings his axe, compromising the structural integrity of the floor and falling straight through. The axe lands directly in his chest. Saitaro snaps out of whatever had been affecting him. He was in a similar state to Yuta. I don't think he's fully back to normal yet, since Mr. Smarty Pants asks Rin to pull the axe out of his chest. Legitimate safety tip for you all. If you have ever been stabbed or impaled, leave the object inside of you and call for help. That object is plugging your wound and stopping a large portion of the blood from coming out. If you do what these two morons decide to do, you will die. Saitaro stands up, starts complaining about dying in a miserable way, stumbles out to the swamp, insults Rain four more times, tells her that he wants her to live, and then collapses backward into the depths. She tries to pull him back to the surface, only managing to grab his watch before losing him forever. Using a book in the library about orienteering using a watch instead of a compass, Rain figures out where she is on the map of the swamp. She rolls the boat into the water before puttering over to the marked spot. After kicking some dirt off of it, she finds a trapdoor leading to a freezing cold tunnel. There's a door at the end next to some dynamite, but it's securely locked. She attempts to beat the door down to no avail, eventually giving up and returning. Yuta spots her in the distance and runs up. He encourages her to come inside since it looks like it's gonna rain soon. Rain hallucinates Seitaro being on the other side of the swamp, alive and well. She tells Yuta to take Yuka and return home before diving into the water. Before Yuta 
Rebecca can help her, a gunshot rings out from behind him. He turns, recognizing his killer. He loses his balance, falling into the depths. This ending is called Secrets, which is fitting because we got basically no information. Seitaro went crazy, Rin drowned, Yuta either died from his gunshot wound or by drowning, and Yuka was left to never be cured. We don't know why anyone was acting weird, what Yuka's condition was, or even who ended up killing Yuta. My best guess is Mr. Suchida, but we don't even know if he was actually evil yet. The next endings we'll take a look at are in a separate save file where the firewood mechanic actually worked. This time, Rin was able to warm up her friend's room. Instead of coming back to Yuka's room to find Yuta staring at her, Rin returns to find her friend completely covered in blood. For lack of a better word, she looks like she popped because of the change in temperature. Yuta learns about what happened, screaming, it tore, over and over again. He decides he cannot live without Yuka, pointing the tip of the knife somewhere else. Yuta snaps back to reality, begging Seitaro for help before bleeding out. The rest of the game is absolutely identical to the previous ending. The only difference is that the door at the end of the game is unlocked for some reason. We never get a clear reason as to why this is. The room behind the door has five tanks containing the bodies of people who seem to be in a similar state to Yuka. The door locks behind Rin, leaving her trapped inside. Now I say trapped very loosely here. There is an axe on the floor that Rin could absolutely use to free herself, but she refuses to do so. Days later, Mr. Suchida enters the room. Seems that he's the one to lock her in there. He panics as he realizes that Rin used the axe to shatter one of the tanks, eating the flesh of one of the people. He refers to this victim as a mermaid. Rin's mental state is completely shattered. Mr. Suchida leads her outside, telling her the story of a nun that ate mermaid flesh, becoming immortal. He leaves Rin in the middle of the woods where she goes even more insane, cackling about her newfound immortality while running through the foliage. This ending makes a little bit more sense to me. We know that Mr. Suchida has malicious intent as well as that he was keeping mermaids in his basement. But those didn't look like mermaids, they looked like people with Yuka's condition. Maybe that's part of the delusion Psycho talked about in the dreams? Either way, we're halfway through now. This next ending is a result of popping Yuka but punching Saitaro instead of dodging. Since Saitaro is alive, he's the one that teaches Rin about navigating with the watch. You also get to hear his thoughts on the legend of Mermaid Swamp, which is really interesting. He brings up a lot of really good points. Legends are generally made to either keep people away or bring people in. This one is clearly intended to keep people away, but from what? This isn't some kind of tourist spot. The only people nearby are from the small village. So if there's nobody to use it on, why create such an elaborate ruse? Also, why would the mermaid's curse result in girls from the village vanishing? Shouldn't the wrath of the mermaid be brought down upon the Suchidas? Why attack random village girls? None of it makes sense, and Saitaro wants to find out the truth. The two use the watch to find the X on the map, maneuvering through the tunnel and finding the same room. Saitaro immediately connects the dots. These people are supposed to be the mermaids in the legend. Rin freaks out, attempting to break the glass. These mermaids are the reason her friends are dead. Saitaro stops her, comforting her as she breaks down. They return to the mansion. Rin stares at the water while Saitaro desperately tries to navigate the fog, always ending back up at the house. Both of them have completely lost hope. They talk about the paintings scattered throughout the mansions. About how Ophelia looked so beautiful in them. About how it seems like a peaceful way to go. We cut to black, with the implications quite clear. This is the best ending by far. Because of Seitaro, we got a lot more information and could actually draw a few conclusions without getting proper answers. This encourages people to go for the true ending. To get the true ending, everyone needs to survive. Yuka needs to remain cold, Yuta needs to go on a rampage, and Rin needs to physically knock some sense back into Seitaro. Everything will be exactly the same as before up until the conversation in the mermaid room. Now that his friends aren't dead, Seitaro magically knows more about the situation. Maybe the stress was getting to him last time? He immediately recognizes that these are corpses that are being preserved. The body is submerged in water to prevent it from coming into contact with open air and germs. The body hardens and remains intact. This is what the legend was all about. The reason they don't believe the legend of Mermaid Swamp is because mermaids don't exist. Duh. So what if the woman in the legend wasn't a mermaid? What if the man found a woman on the beach before kidnapping her? What if his love at first sight was associated with water, so he placed her in a fish tank to recreate the circumstances? Living in water all the time would have dropped her body temperature, killing the girl. Seitaro explains that soaking a corpse for a month wouldn't prevent decay, meaning the preservation process began deliberately when the bodies began to swell. Remember the old documents talking about stopping the spread of germs? What if they were discussing the preservation of these bodies? He theorizes that the people doing this love the mermaids, even in this form. Maybe especially in this form. Perhaps the man couldn't let go, doing everything he could to preserve the woman before she began to decompose. The Suchida men are clearly obsessed with Ophelia's story. Being able to recreate and preserve that would be a dream for them. That's why those girls went missing from the village. The Suchidas wanted more. But why create this legend for the public? Why tell anyone at all? It still doesn't fully make sense. As Saitara moves to leave, Rin hears a voice coming from the mermaid. 
return me. Just like always, but what if they wanted to be returned to the Earth? There's dynamite right outside the door. Destroying this tunnel would bury them so they can finally rest in peace. The duo light the fuse, barely escaping before the collapse. When they return back to the mansion, Mr. Suchida greets them. He knows exactly what they did. He claims that the mermaids feared the Suchida family and therefore couldn't seek their help. That's why they're going after outsiders. But why would they be hurting the only people that can save them? Mr. Suchida admits that he was the one to cut the power. He went to the village to keep anyone there from talking too much. It wouldn't do any good for the college kids to learn the truth. Mr. Suchida's ancestors did something terrible, something that a simple monument wouldn't be able to make up for. But he couldn't let go of the mermaids because he loved them just as much as those before him. Reen wants to call the police, but Saitaro reminds her that this was over a century ago. The Statue of Limitations is up, and he wasn't the one to have killed him. Mr. Suchida gave Yuta the map everyone wanted so dearly. He plans to spend the rest of his life mourning. Reen and Saitaro reunite with Yuta. The car seems to be working now, and he has the map, just like Suchida said. The group carry Yuka to the car and navigate towards the nearest hospital. As they grow further from the swamp, Yuka's form returns to normal. The hospital saw nothing wrong with her, and she remembered absolutely nothing other than being cold. Everyone went back to their normal lives, and Reen stopped having her nightmares. I've played through this entire game twice, rewatched every ending multiple times, and scoured the wikis, yet I still do not understand what happened in this game. I understand what the Legend of Mermaid Swamp is, but not everything else. How much of the curse was true? Uri always has supernatural aspects to her games, so were the ghosts of these mermaids behind Yuka's condition? If so, why? To garner sympathy for themselves by forcing the kids to see someone they care about suffering from the same fate? The shadow that was near Yuka did seem pretty big, so what if one of them possessed her and that's why she changed forms? According to the wiki, Yuta and Seitaro were both possessed by the ghost of the Suchida men who killed the mermaids, which is why Yuta was so obsessed with Yuka's new form. I don't get why Seitaro was going after Rin, though. We know Seitaro was possessed in the graveyard, but when did it happen to Yuta? And what's up with Saiko? We can assume that she left because she knew about the mermaids in some capacity. Did the ghosts of the mermaids cause the death of her and her children? Why did Mr. Suchida keep these kids around in the first place? Was he able to tell that the mermaids were calling for help from outsiders so he abandoned these kids so they would set the mermaids free? That makes some sense. He could have been conflicted, disturbed by the actions of his ancestors, but too in love with the mermaids to take action. That's why he had the kids do it. The people in the village claimed that outsiders had shown up before and that bad things had always happened to them. If there had been multiple attempts to get poor unsuspecting strangers to save them, why make the clues to the story so hidden? Just throw a diary with the whole story in your room and conveniently drop the key before you leave. They clearly set some things up like that, like the conveniently placed dynamite. So why not everything? Maybe the ghosts of the Suchida men knew of this plan and that's why they were possessing people? To try and stop it from happening? But then why not have non-Suchidas from the village put the mermaids to rest? Because they didn't call upon them for help? And if any of this theorizing is true, why is Mr. Suchida actively killing these kids in some of the other endings? I just don't understand. As far as I can tell, Mermaid Swamp is a game about a cult of inflation fetishists taking advantage of some college kids while their ancestors violate them. Remember that scene I had to gloss over with Yuta? He was possessed during that time. A ghost was doing that to someone else's body. Mermaid Swamp is by far my least favorite Uri game. This game made me realize how important the plot is for Uri's games. I will never touch this game again, but I'll absolutely go back to play Paranoiac, even though the gameplay was far worse. This game's story is a confusing mess. The setup is full of cliches, the setting is boring, the dialogue is irritating, and the plot is left so open-ended that I spent hours researching to try and wrap my head around what happened. In the end, there weren't even any consequences for the antagonists. It was entirely unsatisfying. The game introduced two annoying characters and two tolerable characters before throwing the nice ones out the window so we could listen to bickering for two and a half hours. The emphasis was put so heavily on unlikable characters that I felt absolutely nothing during the endings where these people died. This game has no meaning. No lesson to be learned, no message to convey. You just watch a bunch of college kids undergo emotional torment with little to no character development or payoff. I still can't believe I'm saying any of this, because this game was created by one of my favorite developers. I literally had to double check that this game was made by Uri partway through the game. It falls flat in every single regard, from the visuals to the gameplay, and especially in the story. If you want to play something good by this developer, please check out the Strange Men Anthology. I love these games so much that I made an entire series dedicated to talking about them. Once again, I'd like to thank War Thunder for sponsoring this video. If you're a new user or haven't played in six months, make sure to check out my link below to get a bonus pack when you play the game for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. I hope to see you all again. 
Have a great rest of your day.